Whenever two seconds, two seconds. Whenever someone two tries to join, mm -hmm. whenever someone tries to join, then you get the notification as well. <laughs> So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Silver Circle Autumn Online Gathering. It's wonderful to see everybody, even though some of you are really, really up very, very, very early. People are coming in from all over from California way through to India. So welcome, everybody, to our autumn gathering. It's just the beginning of autumn. First of all, I would like to just give a little bit of an idea about how and where Silver Circle are from, who we are a Silver Circle. Many of you will know who we are, but for those who don't know who we are, in 1980, the Silver Circle Network was founded and started in the Netherlands. Uh, at the same time, we also started the magazine Wiccan Raid, which is still, in a digital form at least, still going strong. So Silver Circle has been around for uh, more than 40 years now and is operational in many countries and in many senses we have been able to introduce Wicca to many people, many people coming through from paganism and looking for experienced witches and trying to find out a little bit more about Wicca. So that's been one of our main functions to inform people and hopefully give good information about uh, Wicca, especially about Gardnerian Wicca. That's basically ours. And here we are today. Wiccan Red, as I said, is still functioning as a, an Anglo-Dutch magazine. The Silver Circle forums and websites are also multilingual. We have Silver Circle websites in Russia, Germany, Spain, and the, the, the Dutch one is also Anglo-Dutch. So that's all we have about Silver Circle, but we can raid. We've had many, many people writing articles for Wiccan Raid over the years. And today I would like to highlight some of those authors by letting them tell us a little bit more about their background or one of their favorite subjects. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Reese, who has been a member of our own circle, or we often call them circles, for many, many years. I've known Reese quite a long time. He's also a member of a gardening covenant in Suffolk in the United Kingdom. And he was initiated in the craft in 1995 and has been a member of three covens in that time. He has a master's degree in philosophy and works as a teacher, teaching young people with autism, teaching them history, citizenship and religious studies. He lives, as I said, in the Suffolk countryside along with his wife, Martika. Today, he's going to be talking about Wicca, a mystery tradition, the great work. So, Rhys, would you like to start your presentation? Thank you very much. Right, I should just uh, share a screen here. Uh, we want that one, we want this one. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. This is brilliant. Okay. So thank you very much for, for listening to my talk. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, about Wicca as a mystery tradition today. Um, it's important, I think, to say right at the start uh, that there are different ways of thinking about Wicca. Um, uh, than, than just as a mystery, that just as a mystery tradition. Some people may see it in more a shamanic sense. Some people might see it in a, in a more sort of pagany kind of way. Uh, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I know I always get a bit frustrated when people tell me what uh, Wicca should be about. So um, what I would like to stress today is really that this talk is, is based on uh, my own training and my own experience of the craft. Okay, and it's not meant to... Um, be preachy or, or take anything away from anybody else's experience of Wicca at all. Um, 
So I just want you to sort of say that at the start. I mean, when I was uh, when I was trained in the craft, I was trained uh, uh, to think of the craft as a, a tradition that was about the worship, celebration and participation of life. Uh, and in life, of course, that includes death. So uh, the goddess and the horn god as, as life and death and participating in the, the, the wheel of the year and in the cycles of the moon. Uh, and for me, I was uh, sort of really taught that uh, the craft was part of the Western mystery tradition. Okay, and that there was a, a little bit of a difference between sort of general paganism and, and Wicca in what its purpose was. Uh, one of the sort of, um, sort of pithy comments that, uh, that was uh, made when I was training was that the main difference between paganism and craft is that uh, paganism is about worshipping the gods or at least honouring the gods, whereas the purpose of the craft is to become god. Okay, so uh, that was a little sort of pithy statement that was made. Another pithy statement that was made was the difference between a pagan and witch was if you cut a pagan, they bleed. If you cut a witch, you die. That was the other one that they said. Anyway, so uh, Western mystery tradition and the great work, what do these terms mean? What do we mean by mystery? Okay, and what do we mean by the great work? And uh, it's really those, I'm uh, trying to answer those questions um, that I'm going to be talking about today. So, what do we mean by mystery or mystery tradition? So the scholar of uh, religion or historian of religion, Karen Armstrong, suggests that the word mystery comes from the Greek verb uh, mysterion, which means to shut the mouth. Okay, and uh, I think we can think of the word mystery in three ways. So first of all, we can think of it as uh, uh, the word mystery means that it, it refers to something secret or private. Okay, so, um, and certainly in the craft, there are, we do keep our, our rituals and our rites fairly secret, or private, I think would be a better word. Secret suggests something sort of a, a little bit dodgy or something like that, but private, I think, is a better word to use. And I think there are good reasons for this. Um, I'm reminded of the, the story that Joseph Campbell, the expert in mythology, uh, um, says, where he talks about why some rites are kept uh, secret. He tells the story of an uh, initiate that goes through an initiation process uh, in the ancient world, where he, he goes through the, the various parts of the ritual, uh, enacting the mythology, until he comes to the Holy of Holies, where he's told that he's going to meet uh, his God. And so he's taken into the Holy of Holies and is confronted by this uh, 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 rectangular kind of uh, uh, device and covered with a cloth, and they whip the cloth away, and he's shown a mirror uh, showing that, that he was actually the God, he's, you know, looking into his reflection. And Campbell says that um, uh, if the, the initiate had known this before he'd undergone his initiation process, okay, it would have spoilt the, the psychological uh, or the, the consciousness split that would, that would happen when it is just revealed to him like that. And that was why they kept that kind of, um, that those uh, rights secret from, from the initiates. And I think in terms of the word mystery, uh, there is uh, some sense where that's true of the craft as well. But I think really when we're talking about mystery in mystery traditions, it's not this keeping things private so much uh, that we're talking about. It's rather it's something else. Uh, another way of thinking the word mystery is uh, a mystery is, is, is something like a problem to be solved. So it could be the mysteries of the universe, okay, how stars come into being, or how to uh, he, uh, how to heal a disease or something like that, okay. So it's something that scientists are very good to solve these mysteries. It's also something that detectives are good at as well. So if we think about detective novels, Sherlock Holmes or whatever, they solve a mystery. Now I think it's important to, to stress the point that when we're talking about mystery traditions, we're not talking about this kind of mystery at all. We're talking about something completely different. And to my mind, it was best summed up by an uh, uh, existentialist philosopher, a Christian existentialist philosopher called Gabriel Marcel, okay? And he uh, 
made the distinction between uh, the kind of mysteries that are solved by scientists and detectives and the kind of mysteries that we're talking about in mystery traditions. And there's a wonderful quote from his in Karen Armstrong's book, The, the History of God, okay, where Gabrielle Marcel distinguishes between a problem, something met, which bars my passage and is before me in its entirety, and a mystery, something to which I find myself caught up in and whose essence is not before me in its entirety. So what Gabrielle Marcel is saying here is that a mystery is some kind of experience, some kind of experience that goes beyond everyday language's ability to describe. Hence going back to Karen Armstrong's idea of uh, closing the mouth, okay? So it's, uh, it's something that we participate in, okay but we can't adequately describe it in everyday words and so we tend to use the language of poetry or mythology uh, to try and get across something of that, that something of the nature of that kind of experience now when we're talking about religions and uh, the occult and uh, um, sort of mystery traditions okay these mysteries uh, could be the mysteries of nature and the myth or they could be the experience of, of the divine Okay, often they could be what's called peak experiences, if you're going to use the language of Abraham Maslow, uh, or flow experiences, or they can be sort of numinous experiences. So just to unpack some of those words a little bit very quickly, peak experiences are those experiences that you have where you're like in the zone and, you know, it's just, it's just like that sort of really great kind of in the zone kind of experience. It's very difficult to describe in words, hence why maybe it's a mystery. Numerous experiences are experiences that we have where we're in a sense of awe, wonder, sometimes dread, okay, of, um, uh, of what it is that we're experiencing. So, for example, if we're in a, a vast natural landscape, we could have the sort of numerous experience of being very, very small within that vast landscape. Or if we feel we're in the presence of a god, we can have the numinous experience, that numinous relationship with the God. Okay, so that sense of wonder and dread, that something very important, fundamental and special is happening to us. And in a sense, these are mysteries. These are the kinds of mysteries that we experience in mystery traditions. They could be the rising of the sun, or they could be more archetypal and visceral as in life experience, such as the experience of giving birth or the experience of sex and sexuality, of, of uh, sacrifice, giving things up, growing old and death. These are all sort of archetypal experiences that people have and are celebrated within, the, um, within, with, within Wicca and the craft. Okay, particularly these archetypal experiences of birth, growing up, sex and sexuality, parenthood, sacrifice, growing old and death. All these kinds of things are tied up within the myth of the wheel of the year. And the Wheel of the Year is about what's going on in nature around us, which is a wonderful thing to celebrate. But it's also uh, a celebration of our own lives. It uh, gives us these sort of ritual points, okay, where we're dealing with these fundamental, visceral kind of experiences of participating and being alive, uh, but it allows us to hang our own meaning on these things as well. And that's kind of part of, of what, what might be called the lesser mysteries. Okay, being involved in the wheel of the year and experience these kinds of things and re-experiencing these kinds of things, reflecting on them, finding meaning within them as, as in the process of our, our own lives. Um, but uh, the mysteries can also have a profound effect upon us as well. So we're all familiar um, with the idea of the, Delf the, the Delphic Oracle, you know, with the legend, know thyself, uh, uh, over the, the sort of entrance. Okay, Socrates, of course, also talks about knowing thyself and a, a li an unexamined life is not worth living and so on. Now, Vivian Crowley, in her uh, excellent book, uh, Wicca, uh, The Old Religion in the New Millennia, which I, to my mind is uh, still the best book on the craft, uh, says that these sort of uh, participation in the mysteries can also lead to inner change. Okay, and uh, this is part of what we mean by the great work. Now, the great work is a term that's being used uh, in occultism, particularly the sort of hermetic style occultism uh, for years and years and years. And it's the idea of uh, inner transformation. 
okay, and then sort of growing towards this idea of oneness with the divine, um, which I think is an important part, at least from my own experience in the craft as well. Okay, so the idea is um, that by participating within uh, the rituals and exposing ourselves to the mysteries, okay, it has a process of, of uh, uh, helping us to understand different parts of ourselves and then using this kind of information we're trying to transform ourselves to expand our consciousness to transcend our ego okay so that we can start to have uh, the experiences or the direct experience of, of the, the divine okay so I think uh, this is an important part of, of craft work is this inner change and this inner work this idea of transcend, transcending the ego the ego is that part of ourselves of which we think we are, okay? And by carrying out occult work, like the craft and so on, okay, we're trying to expand our sense of who we are beyond just the ego until it starts to include the divine as well, okay? And so that way, uh, as we are all part of the divine anyway, we, we come to raise our consciousness Okay, so that we identify not just with our narrow sense of who we are, but with a, a larger sense of self, which in the end, when it leads towards mystical experience, includes the whole of the cosmos. Uh, Alistair Crowley said had quite a lot to say about the great work. And for him, it was about uh, uniting different aspects of ourselves, our psyches, uh, uh, sort of the ego, male and female, ego, non-ego, he says there, microcosm, macrocosm, okay, around the central point, constellating around the self, okay, and expanding us the, the sense of identity to include the divine. And uh, one useful language to use, and it's uh, the language that Vivian Crowley uses in her book, um, Wick of the Old Religion and the New Millennium, is the language that was given to us by the Swiss psychologist Carl Jung. Uh, who uh, was very much influenced by the Western mystery tradition, uh, particularly Gnosticism and Hermeticism, as well as Eastern traditions as well, uh, all of which try to do similar sorts of things, uh, where he said that the sort of process of, uh, that we go through a process in our lives where we become more and more who we are. And again, it's just about transcending the ego. It's about saying that we're more than just who we think we are, Okay, there's a lot more to us than that. And Carl Jung's uh, process was the idea of expanding this sense of who we are to incorporate these different parts of ourselves. Um, I've got a little bit of a diagram there. It's not particularly a very good diagram um, and it's quite sort of complicated to go into. So I don't want to say too much about that today, but it's a language that is well worth looking into if you're interested in, in uh, um, in finding a language that is useful for working that in, in terms of the great the great work and, and inner change and so on. But I would certainly recommend Vivian Crowley's book. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's the process of individuation, coming who you are, uh, which is a, a lifelong process. It's not like enlightenment where you suddenly just get it and sit back and drink sake. It's a lifelong continuous kind of process, as is the process of identifying, expanding of ego um, to include the sense of the divine. So in the craft, um, we do this in, in various ways, this, uh, this idea of the great work of uh, working on ourselves and expanding our sense of identity and consciousness to include that of the divine. So we might start off by balancing the elements within us. Now the elements, earth, air, fire and water, they also represent aspects of ourselves as well. So for example, uh, water can represent our emotions and the air can represent our sort of uh, cognitive uh, faculties. Uh, earth represents our sensation, uh, sense, big sensation, uh, sort of perceptive kind of uh, faculties and, uh, and fire represents will and, and desire and so on. So we start off by trying to get those things into balance so that we can deal with the world in a kind of wiser way, really. Um, so we're coming from a place of balance and, and identifying those different elements and, be, and identifying ourselves with those different elements within us. Then it's part, being part of the wheel of the year, experiencing the mysteries of life and death. 
Okay, so that's being involved in the wheel of the year, celebrating the seasons, but also celebrating those uh, visceral archetypal kind of experiences that are contained within the myth of the wheel of the year. And while we're doing that, we're also trying to transcend our ego. Okay, we're trying to, to move beyond the narrow sense of who we are. Okay, and uh, this can involve things like service to others. All the world religions um, recommend service to other people as a way of transcending ego, putting other people first. But it's also part of what's meant by keeping silent as well. Uh, so people that are always um, bragging on Facebook and things like that probably aren't uh, transcending their ego, perhaps, if they're grandstanding a lot. Okay, um, we're trying to, to, to go beyond this narrow sense of who we are uh, uh, and identify with a larger self. Okay, so if, we, if people need to have a lot of um, praise and input, it makes it very difficult for them to transcend their ego. By transcending our ego, then, invocation of the gods. So this is raising our, our awareness, raising our consciousness, um, so that we become aware of the gods within and without ourselves as well. Okay, so idea of as above, so below. Uh, that is uh, very popular in, in sort of hermetic traditions. The idea is that we are the same as what's outside of ourselves. Okay, if we find the gods within ourselves, then we'll find them outside ourselves as well. Okay, so it's this raising of consciousness. So I don't tend to see invocation as calling something in, rather I see it more of a raising of consciousness so we become aware uh, of our connections with the divine. Okay, and start to identify with that divine as well, not in an intellectual sense, but in the sense of um, uh, experience, uh, if you like, this experience of identification with the divine. And in that in itself is a mystery. Uh, then we have the great right later on, which is a reconciliation of polarity. So it's bringing all these disparate parts of ourselves together uh, to make one sort of whole uh, union of which we then identify or have the experience of identifying with Godhead. Okay, and I think that's kind of like a, a, like part of the journey of being an initiate. But I think also, though, the, the union of self and Godhead with this mystical experience, which I'll talk a little bit about shortly, is only the middle point of the craft career, because then after that you have to integrate that sort of transformation into your life and then be able to pass on uh, tips and uh, teach people how to have those kinds of experiences themselves. So um, the great work then is about transcendence of ego, okay, and, and expansion of consciousness. It's the syzygy, or like bringing together the polarity within ourselves, Okay, so um, polarity is uh, seeming opposites. Actually, they're just different sides of the same coin. Okay, and by integrating the polarity within ourselves, okay, so, so, so that uh, we're dealing with the whole and not just the extremes in the range. Okay, uh, so we're dealing with the whole of ourselves, not just different points. Okay, that helps to, to with this uh, expansion of uh, transcendence of ego and expansion of consciousness. We're constellating all these different parts of ourselves uh, around the self. Okay, that's what we're centering ourselves uh, with these different sorts of parts of ourselves around. It's just difficult to explain, really, but that's kind of like what we're doing. And then we're identifying or having the experience of identifying the whole self with the divine. Okay, this is this raising of consciousness. Okay, we're experiencing, um, the, yeah, the identification with the experience of the identification with the ultimate, the ground of being, which is mystical experience. So this is where we have to start to go beyond religion. Okay, um, Jung said the greatest barrier to religious experience was religion. Okay, so we need to go beyond religion, we need to go beyond our symbols, uh, beyond, our, beyond the gods even, okay, to start to get, an under, to, to get this feeling of a, or, or the experience uh, of the whole, a mystical experience. Now, as I said before, I see Wicca as part of the Western mystery tradition. 
Okay, it's had lots of inputs from other areas as well, such as the Romantic poets and uh, from uh, traditional ideas about witchcraft and folklore and things like that. And that's all a really important part of the craft and makes it what it is. But I think ultimately its parents really was the Western mystery tradition. And, and that's where it sort of comes from um, through time. And I think its goals are, are pretty similar to that of the Western mystery tradition as well. Although sometimes it uses a slightly different language. We don't tend to talk about angels and stuff like that uh, as they do in, in other parts of the WMT. Uh, and it deals, I think, with metaphorical and metaphysical truths rather than literal truths. Um, one of the things that I try and teach my children in religious studies is that there is a difference between religious and scientific truth. Okay, and we can get ourselves in a big bother where we start to think of uh, religious truths in the same way as we think of scientific truths. Religious truths uh, tend to work in terms of metaphor. They work in the same way as poetry or art. Uh, and uh, sort of religious truth tends to be more about what's apt, what, what's work, what sort of, it's more of a, 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 an emotional and feeling kind of a truth rather than as kind of fact kind of truth if that kind of makes sense. And I think in the craft, if we're working towards a uh, mystical experience and if we're working towards um, uh, the great work and so on, um, part of the sort of metaphysical kind of truth that we're looking for is rather than separating things up into lots and lots of different parts, um, we need to be starting to bring things together, okay? So we're saying that there is no difference between uh, nature, uh, humankind, and the gods. Okay, we're all part of the divine. We're all divine. It's a, the, the above, as above, so below thing. Okay, and as Dion Fortune said, all gods are one god, and all goddesses are one goddess, uh, and there is one initiator. So we're not trying to split things up into lots of different parts, but rather we're bringing things all together to a point of oneness, one thing, one connectedness, the whole of the cosmos is one unfolding process, okay? All is one and one is all, all is connected. And when we start to be, start thinking those kinds of terms, we've brought all these different parts of our psyches together um, where we've been identifying with the divine, then we can perhaps have uh, what's called a, a mystical experience. Now, when we talk about mystical experiences, um, the term could be very broad. Uh, even in sort of um, sort of gen historical discourse, people might talk about people like Marjorie Kemp as a mystic uh, and Julian of Norwich as a mystic. The kind of experiences they had was very different. Marjorie Kemp mystical experiences in, in inverted commas were about seeing Jesus on the end of her bed and chatting to Jesus about what Jesus wanted her to do and that kind of thing. Okay, whereas uh, say Julian of Norwich or Master Eckheim had this sort of experience of oneness with the whole of the universe. Okay, so when we're talking about mystical experiences in this sense, I'm talking about it in the more narrow sense uh, and the kind of experiences that Meister Eckhart had, this idea of, of the experience of oneness with the whole of the cosmos, these sort of very profound, life-changing and transformative kind of experiences where there is no difference between yourself and the divine. Okay, and that divine is one and includes all, okay, all and nothing. This sort of narrow sense of the mystical experience was first described by uh, the philosopher and psychologist William James. Okay, he was quite a colourful character. Um, and he described mystical experiences as having these four properties. Okay, firstly, ineffability, which we've already discussed. And this is the idea that uh, you cannot adequately communicate what it's like to have these kind of mystical experiences. Hence, the Sufis tend to write in poetry about it. Um, um, people tend to, to use metaphor to try and sort of just hint at what these kind of experiences are like. You can't use everyday language. Uh, he also said that they had a noetic quality to them. And by that, he meant that um, there was something that you learn from it. Okay, that, that you don't learn, you're not learning through the senses, that having this experience, you learn something profound about the cosmos yourself, the divine. 
okay? They're transitory, they can only last a second. But while you're in these kinds of experiences, you're out of time, you're, you're in eternity. But in terms of everyday real life um, time, it can last a second. And passivity, there's something that happened to you, okay? Um, something that happened to you, it's very difficult to seek out a mystical experience. You can have lots and lots of training towards it, but ultimately it is something that happens to you. It can often happen in things like deep meditation. I'm thinking of things like the, the centering prayer that uh, um, Franciscan um, monks and nuns use that can sometimes lead to mystical experiences the kind of meditation uh, that we do in craft uh, enactment of ritual it can also happen in times of depression and despair as well um, but it's usually something that happens to you and a mystical experience in this sort of narrow sense is defined by an experience of the union with all okay so it's being you know at one with everything to use that sort of old kind of idea you know you're, you're one with everything okay and it can be profoundly transformative it changes the way you see life okay it takes away the fear of death things that have, might have seemed very important to you that you might have been anxious about before will just disappear you know they don't seem so relevant or important anymore okay and it often leaves people with a a, a sense of um wanting to enjoy and live uh, life to the fullest as well. So what I hope to have uh, really just very briefly gone over in this talk, because um, there's not very, not very lot to talk about, a very, very big subject, is that the craft, I see the craft as a mystery tradition, a mystery tradition in the sense that it, it introduces us to the mysteries of life and death. These are not problems to be solved, but things to be experienced and to gain meaning from. There is also the process of the great work where we try to transcend our ego. Okay, so we try to become, to identify and experience being more than that sort of narrow sense of who we are. And part of that is by uh, raising our consciousness to realize and have the experience of that we are part of the divine, that we are the goddess, we are the god, we're part of the goddess and god. And then from there, it's leading on to the mystical experience in the very narrow sense of the word, where we have the experience of oneness with everything, okay, which is a profoundly transforming experience, okay, and then that hopefully leads us on to, to wanting to be able to help other people have that kind of experience as well. And it's an experience that can change our lives. So, so I shall leave it there because I think we had about yes. 20 minutes or so. <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, Reese, there are actually a couple of people who have questions and I'd really like to uh, uh, sure. let, um, let's hear the different questions. Um, Deborah has asked the question, on, her question is, could you speak a little bit more about the Western mystery tradition and Celtic tradition and Norse tradition in the world tree? How does this relate to Wicca? Uh, I think that's going to be a very long question, but could you just give in a very, very short uh, couple of sentences how the mystery tradition relates to Celtic and Norse tradition? An expert on the Celtic tradition, I, I know a little bit about Norse mythology. Um, I, I, uh, the Western mystery tradition is, is really sort of based on sort of things like uh, Neoplatonism and, and Gnosticism and Hermeticism, um, which I don't, uh, they take quite a bit of explaining as it were. Um, the Norse tradition is a sort of a, a pagan, pagan tradition. Um, and I, uh, something I've been looking at recently is this, I, uh, the, 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 the Norse tradition that we have is only like a little kind of um, snippet in time because uh, the, the, the Norse tradition tend to got written down just as it was coming to an end in the Viking Age. Um, so we, we've kind of got the end of that. Although I, I was, you can definitely see that, that like Yggdrasil, the, the, the world tree, um, I suppose you could sort of, uh, in a way, it's a cosmology in a similar way as the, the Kabbalistic tree of life is a cosmology that refers to various yeah. powers within within the human psyche and within in the world. So I can suppose you can, you can definitely see it in that way. 
I, um, I was just thinking that as well, uh, uh, Reese. Of course, many of these symbols are universal, and as Carl Jung has said as well, there are so many uh, symbols which overlap. Of course, yeah. Um, just to again, I'm sorry, we're going to have to cut this very short, but I'd just like to mention um, uh, a comment that uh, Gwyden has actually uh, posted. Um, he's asked actually if you've read Don Frew's essay Wicca as a Theurgic Tradition. And I haven't actually. No, I'll, I'll look out for that. Definitely. Yeah. Well, well uh, of course, Don. I I actually invited him to this uh, meeting. Unfortunately, he's not uh, come on. But um, I will definitely uh, connect you to to Don at a later stage. So thank you ever so much, uh, Reese. Oh, I'm sure we'll be hearing more. Again, everybody, if you want to read more of uh, Reese's articles, of course, he is one of our authors in Wiccan Raid Online. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Without, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Melissa as our next speaker. Now, Melissa's not new to the craft. Um, I, she's got quite an impressive bi biography, but I'm just going to keep it fairly short um, because she has been involved in paganism, in Wicca, in OTO for a long time. But one of Melissa's key interests is the performance of ritual from personal devotions to experimentally transcending the boundaries between outer forms to facilitate common communion with the divine. She is a sought out after ritual leader in Europe and Scandinavia, where she has led the famous firewalks. And this has been for sometimes for more than 200 people. So she's melded different traditions into coherent group rituals and explored adapting the work of magical forebears. She is delighted to have crafted thelemic rituals, usually operated by one person, into successful open pagan rituals and to have achieved dramatic metaphysical phenomena within some public circles. I'm sure a lot of you will know Melissa also from the Pagan Federation. She's also a trustee for Pagan Federation International and a long-standing personal friend. Melissa? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, are you ready, my dear? Can you share your screen? I hope oh, so. Okay. I hope I've got it set up. Let me see if I can. Well, while you're setting that up, I'm going to just explain what your talk is going to be about so you can concentrate. Oh. Um, Melissa is going to talk about Margaret Murray. Now, Margaret <clears> Murray <throat> um, has been debunked but in recent years, people are beginning to realise that perhaps not everything she said was uh, was kind of loony. So Melissa is going to try and redress that balance. So, um, Melissa, at the moment you're on, can you go to full screen? Go to yes, just, just guide me through it, Leslie. Where's yes. full screen? Uh, go to the top where it says slide show. It's transitions, animations, slide show. I yes. can't see that, there. sorry. You're nearly there. You were nearly Where's... There. Where's slideshow? On the top. Can you can you see this? Can you see this? My 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 finger's going now. Oh, I no, can't. I'm okay. sorry. I can. Okay, go to under the orange band, and then you've got file, home, yeah. insert, draw, yeah. design, transitions, animations, slideshow. Click on. The oh, slide. that that is hidden by my band here. Oh. I can't, I can only get to stop video and security. I can't see it. So um, I can only do it like this, maybe. Okay, um, well, well, it's better than nothing. Don't worry. Um, I'm, I'm very I, sorry. I, I've got a big band across my screen that's that's hiding that. Um, no, I can't. I'm, it's anybody getting worse. Um, uh, uh, Melissa? Hi, this is Catherine. Good to see you. Um, down at the below your presentation, there's yeah. some little icons, and one of them looks like a screen. It looks like an open book. Open it book, looks yeah. Like a screen. Click on that. The open book. I've got it. Okay. Is that better? There you go. Excellent. Excellent. Perfect. <laughs> there we but how, how do I change my slides now? How do well, I move? Click you just you'll just click. You'll just click, and you'll you'll be able to change your slides. Okay, well, I'll, I'll shout for help. This is the best I can do. Sorry, guys. So, right. The thing about this is that when I just 
stupidly stopped doing what I was doing and got into studying psychology and then a PhD on why do people become Wiccan. Uh, Vivian Crowley was my supervisor and she sent me off to research the actual background. So I spent nearly a year sitting in the old British Museum, the beautiful thing under the dome, reading everything Margaret Murray had published and just enjoying it and reading all these old books. I'd verged into John Dee and everything. It was nowhere getting me my PhD, but it was wonderful. And then people asked me to talk about it. So it became a talk that went right across Europe and it's been published in Wick and Read. And then Morgana asked me to turn it into a, a talk today. And so I've only literally just finished the PowerPoint because it's so old, it didn't have a PowerPoint and I did run out of time. So I'm sorry, but there is an old copy of this talk in Wick and Read from probably 25 years ago. But it's worth revisiting it now because people are beginning to see what she might have been up to. And I'm going to have to gallop you through this with uh, two slides a second, a minute. So Margaret Murray was from a wealthy Anglo-Indian family. I'll leave this writing here for you um, so you can look at it. She's from a very wealthy Anglo-Indian family. And her father was a businessman who was three times the head of the Chamber of Commerce in Calcutta. And her mother was a missionary who went out there to be a missionary with the main aim of educating people out of poverty, particularly women. And they lived a colonial life, but they were friendly with the servants. Um, and she really enjoyed the whole uh, Hindu lifestyle that she grew up in. Um, very different, like Gerald Gardner. She didn't have a formal education, but she had an inquiring mind. And so you can see how these colonial people were growing up with native people and getting a very different view of Christianity and the world around them. Some of the new people researching her have started looking into this. So one of them says um, that she is um, a hybrid Indian and uh, English uh, person and has actually published her recipe for meat curry, which I think is rather nice, that she was giving out in the old days in England. She lived to be 100 years old and had a fantastic sense of humour, publishing her autobiography, calling it My First 100 Years. And that's actually where I got most of this information from. It's a fabulous read. So she had a very busy childhood um, going between India and um, England. I'm going to have to rush through this. So she got sent off at seven to live with her uncle and his wife, who was a vicar. Uh, lots of church in the family, but he took her to the ancient sites and uh, she would go with her sister Mary and they got to Wayland Smithy and look at the white horse. And she was fascinated. And she writes in her autobiography how she blew through this pre-Christian stone and imagined it summoning the tribes people. And she said she'd like to connect it with the dragon mount and the killing of the dragon by the British Pendragon kings and we know so little about them but when that strange note reverberates it was shivering down her spine and never forgotten she was seven then when she was out in these pagan ancient sites with a religious uncle imagining the old days of the pagans and up at the white horse and they moved around a lot so she went off to Germany and did fluent German returned to Calcutta moved back to England where her dad had an office and at 17 years old she became a nurse in Calcutta and this was looked down on by ladies of her class she was brought up with servants uh, a lot of money and you wouldn't be nursing um, the poor people she nursed throughout a cholera epidemic at the age of 17 years old um, and then she returned to England and lived with her Uncle John, where she became a social worker. Again, she was employed in employment, looking at the poorer people, uh, community based caring. And she stayed there until the death of her father, then went traveling again to visit her sister Mary in India. And it was Mary who suggested that she actually started studying Egyptology. And thus she did. Um, she went to UCL, aged 31, that's a mature student, and started studying. Now, Often mentors make a difference and her mentor was Sir Flinders Petrie, who is a fa famous Egyptologist and him and somebody called Seligman and Haddon championed her, championed her academic career, had her on digs. At the age of 40, she was actually in charge of a team of Muslim men excavating in the desert with tins keeping her food from the ants. And she discovered the temple of Seti cementing her reputation in Egyptology. So she was actually a, a very well-respected Egyptologist who was given a fellowship in 1922 and stayed on in the job until she was 72 years old. She also gave public lectures and published a lot of material. If you think about it, this was the era of Egyptology, the era of like Crowley, um, 
Flaws Castle, the discovery of the tomb of um, Tutankhamun. This was the era that she was a foremost fellow in. So she was actually a very successful author. When I had this wonderful time in the British Museum, I read all her books and there were millions of them, doing many excavations, Palestine, Malta, Menorca, involved in all of it, 44 items in the catalogue of the British Library, no finite record, uh, primary author of, of many, many books. Many books. What's happened to that? And so a very successful author in Egyptology. And here she is actually publicly unwrapping a mummy. Um, I think it might be the unwrapping of Kanumnacht, one of the mummies from the tomb of the two brothers. Um, it's a bit difficult piercing it together, but there's a new order, a new biography of her has come out. I haven't had time to read, which might tell us more. But this photo has been floating around and this is a diminutive little woman unwrapping this mummy uh, at the Manchester Museum. And this is by one of her students when she was 53, which is just about when she starts looking into witchcraft. Um, and what people haven't known in the past is what a firm supporter she was of women's suffrage. So she was very much a feminist. She's already been a nurse and fought against opposition in her career where people wouldn't publish things, she says, because she was a woman. It could have been because some of it in, in the witchcraft later was rubbish, but in Egyptology, it was actually very good. She got involved in the suffragette movement by Mrs. Selden Amos, the wife of Judge Selden Amos, who was codifying Egypt. And she really lived it, like marching into uh, meetings with men, smoking cigars. She actually penned a book called The Genesis of Religion, where she talked about female superiority and muses about how you could go from a great goddess to a repressed sort of Virgin Mary. She has a whole theory of religion with the female as the superior being. Um, I have the book, The Genesis for Religion. It's pretty potty, but it has this whole feminist philosophy that would not be out of place with the later feminist philosophies of the 70s. And all through her life, it, if you look at her life story, she always was annoyed at the pitying contempt that scholars had for pre-Christian religion and the way they sort of prioritised science and, 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 and talked about primitive, unenlightened heathens indulging in devil worship. She thought that this was very, very biased. Um, and she's probably right, because if you look at things like the Lindau man, just because he's being garroted, even today, people have said that, that he was probably a ritual sacrifice. And this is something that Ronald Hutton has argued against. And she already felt that. And she felt that they lacked sympathy for the ancient workers who misrepresented them and had a huge Christian bias, often defending pagans and heathens. And talking about fertility rights, blessing, blessing boats in Christianity, how they'd forgotten their pagan past. She was interested in the paranormal. If you read uh, some of her pamphlets and some of her autobiography, she's got all sorts of theories about ghosts, all sorts of things. She will dismiss superstition, but she'll try to find a rational scientific explanation, like ghosts were due to light rays so striking sort of misty bits of atmosphere and usually seen in damp places where there's less traffic disturbance. It's fascinating. Somebody should write all this up about her. I can't believe I wrote this 25 years ago. Still not come out. Um, so here she is getting a little older, 1928. She's still not got into the folklore and the witchcraft. Um, and already she's got, got grey hair and, and, and it should have been retired. She had great interest in magic. One of the great things about reading her work was all these little pamphlets she had done. Um, stuff on the astrological character of Egyptian magic wands, Egyptian elements in the gray, Grail Romance, divination. Uh, ancient religion. She even had a, a book of religious Egyptian poetry, which was a wonderful little book of shadows. So she spent a lot of her life studying Egypt. And when you read her book, The Splendor That Was Egypt, she is in awe of the Egyptian religion. She's in awe of this ancient, massive, thousands and thousands of years of ancient religion. She feels close to God in the temple and says that like sunrise in Abu Simbel where she was working is like a deeply metaphysical, magical um, experience for her. So you can see that before she actually got involved in anything to do with witchcraft, she was already sympathetic to pagan and heathenism, used to sort of Hindu rites with um, female aspects, a feminist um, with the God in, with pantheon, sorry, pantheonic rites in Hinduism. She was a feminist. Uh, she's looking at pantheons in ancient Egypt. She's seeing powerful figures of femininity, mystery, magic, all that's going long before she gets introduced to anything to do with witchcraft. 
She liked collecting ritual texts. Um, I did type out some of these, but not all of them. It'd be lovely to sort of reprint her book of curses and spells, etc. cetera. Um, it's really on a par with what Leyland was doing, but he, he got much more sort of notice for what he was doing. But then she got into witchcraft. Um, so The Witch Cult in Western Europe was published in 1921 when she was 58. She'd finally stopped being a workaholic because she was felt to be too old to uh, work as a nurse and um, on the front. Um, but the university had closed down because all the young men had gone off to war. And her books were like selling very, very, very well. Oh, she believed in reincarnation as well just like Gardner with all the stuff he was digging up you can imagine them chatting somewhere about all these similar beliefs they had from different sources uh, she's actually got a lovely sort of idea that um sort of slightly Buddhist that if we don't fulfill our great work we have to keep coming back but if we if we do manage it we go off into that almighty power in which we live and have our being so when the first world war broke out where did she go where did she choose to go of all the places in the world she went to Glastonbury um, and while she was there, she developed an interest in Joseph of Arimathea and the Grail legend, which did lead to that paper, Egyptian Elements in the Grail Romance. So she's still hanging on to her old sort of academic life, but beginning to move in another direction. Oh. <laughs> and I think this is an important quote. This is what she says got her into the study of witchcraft. Um, she says, someone, I forgot who, I bet she didn't, had once told me that the witches obviously, now I can't read that because my, my screen, unfortunately, had a special form of religion for the dance around a black goat. As ancient religion is my pet subject, this seemed to be in my line. And during the rest of the war, I worked on witches. I started with the usual idea that witches were all old women suffering from illusions about the devil and that their persecutors were wickedly prejudiced and perjured. I worked solely on contemporary records, and when I realised the so-called devil was simply a disguised man, I was startled, almost alarmed by the way the recorded facts fell into place and showed that witches were members of an old and primitive form of religion, and the records had been made by a new and persecuting form. So that was her aha moment in Glastonbury, working on original texts of witch trials, where she has this realization. Now, we don't know if that realization is actually technically correct at all, but it was her truth, her moment, her vision, which could be based on everything she'd already seen in all of her life and having this idea. But it was an idea that was enough to write her books, which sold very, very well, and to inspire Gardner and to write the foreword of his book with all the um, kudos she had as this, this associate professor to back up what Gardner was saying, that there was this ancient witch cult. And that was the book with a picture of Goya. And, and they all they all did very well, these books. And, and she ended up being the person that wrote the definitive uh, piece on witchcraft in the British Encyclopedia Britannica for decades. Um, so her theory was that there was a witch cult in Western Europe. And she, she, she just went to completely keep writing about that. And she proposed a model of a male dominated witch cult with covens characterized by a master who is a man in black, often called the devil, with an initiation that included the renunciation of Christianity, a covenant, a new baptism and the receipt of the devil's mark. Now she's got this from the confessions, but she's also looked at other things and depicts a frolics of the Esba and the Sabbath. We still use these words with homage, dancing, music, making music and love, feasting, magical practices were very similar simple sort of fertility rites, uh, magic, divination, blah, blah, blah. But each book depicted the witches as nicer, better, good country people. They weren't doing evil stuff. She was writing it out. She would take a um, quotation that, that um, she put dot, 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 where she'd taken something out and she'd take more and more out as she wove this story. And it actually really annoyed, um, really annoyed the critics at the time. Oh, these are the way my slides are going. So uh, she was as convinced as Gardner, but there was a difference in what they were describing. And this is important to, 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 to know because she's taken from the old witch trials. She has a man in black, a devil running this, whereas Gardner has the goddess. So they're actually very, very different images. Her having something that has all that sort of um, old 
looking craft with the devil with the man in black with the goat and gardener's new thing which fits more into what we do and into modern feminism these are core different practices so it is worth remembering that and this is her now 1938 when she's now mainly working in witchcraft still looking quite sharp but quite old but at the time, what is interesting, there was a lot of criticism on her work. Um, all the academics at the time were absolutely horrified. Uh, Cecil the Strange Ewan published a book on some witchcraft criticisms and talked, th these are what they said she was doing wrong, limiting her research, um, putting out unfounded research, unwarranted omissions and additions. Um, he's saying maybe this wasn't intentional, but when you put it together, it's not right. She's complacent in her views. Uh, other people carried on criticising Parinder, Thomas, Cohn, chipping away at it, Kirk Heffer, Monte, Clates, Levac, Quaife, even Hutton 1991. So there never was an academic support for what Margaret Murray was writing, ever. But the support was just that people loved it. It fitted with what they wanted, just as it fitted with what she wanted. Um, and it gave Gardner the support he needed to get going. Remember, he came on as an anthropologist that had found the ancient witch cult that she had talked about. And that's how he was writing. He wasn't saying he was making it up as he was going along or that they were little scattered covens like we now know from Philip Heselton. So the academics never uh, supported Murray, but but they, they just saw her becoming... Um, this figure. And it became known as the folklore hypothesis, which annoyed them so much that um, it did annoy them. But it was particularly because she was made the president of the Folklore Society. And you wonder what was going on, because she was actually 90 to 92 when she was the president. And nobody had liked her methods. But maybe if you think about it, it's the beginning of Wiki. You think Wiki's taking off with Gardner's books, as she has all of her um, Encyclopedia Britannica, you're just before the swinging 60s. Somebody loved it, other than the proper academics. The modern folklore view is, is one of horror. Jacqueline Simpson wrote a whole huge article in Folklore in 1994, who says no folklorist can remember Dr. Margaret Murray without embarrassment and a sex of paradox. Um, I won't read it all because I'm sensitive to the time, but she was deeply flawed with illogical arguments. And it, it, she only wrote e eccentric books that harmed the reputation of the society and the status of folklorists. It's disturbing to see it known as the Murrayite or folklorist hypothesis. She only wrote one article on witches and reviews of her books were far from enthusiastic. So folklorists repudiate this, but it was called the folklorist hypothesis by um, people beginning to study the modern history of witchcraft that were beginning to study where it might have come from other than this lost old religion. And so it was just bundled into that. And it is quite folkloric, really, in that she's looking at the folklore and the witch trials, etc. It's not scientific. It's not sociological. Um, it's not psychological. So it sort of stands, but it did, did embarrass them a lot. But here she is on her 100th birthday, um, being given a, a presentation at UCL. So she, it's a sense of paradox that she maintained a great, um, great uh, reputation as an Egyptologist, but never as a folklorist. But she did seem to know a number of witches from what she writes, know a lot about witchcraft practice. And I think she may well have known Gardner and everybody in a much more intimate um, way than, than she perhaps pretended to. <clears throat> there's new recognition now. There's new books come out I haven't read. This biography by Kathleen Shepherd, who published her meat curry recipe. And they talk about her really, in many ways, as feminist, as the first woman practicing archaeology with professional successors, pioneering Egyptology, her feminism, and a huge body of work she did after retirement. Um, she's still got a picture in the Petrie Museum uh, um, in Egypt. And she still got the sense at 100 years old to write my first 100 years with her, her absolutely unabashed um, pride in her work, including her work on witchcraft. And to say, if you look back at her quote about the life work, that um, it is up to us to do our work and we are each called to do the divine duty. And she also says about Emily Davidson, I don't know why I get upset because she was a quite a rebel that some women die in self-sacrifice and people just say that they were they were deranged but some women know what they must sacrifice to achieve that duty 
Um, so she willfully ignored her own sources and Simpson says she had a passionate system building of rites, initiation, dates for festivals, discipline and hierarchy within current covens. So what she was actually doing seems to have not been actually recording some old religion, but creating one, which is fascinating. Um, and Simpson says uh, she has this massive inclusion of all sorts of things. It's just this magic kaleidoscope that she crashes together into this thing that they find embarrassing. But if you think about the swinging 60s coming up and it's psychedelic and it's looking for shamans and teachers and opening the mind and all that, she's actually right on target. If you think about Robin Hood, the Celtic mysteries, etc., she's bang on for a popular populist movement. And as I finish that chapter in, in, in Wiccan Raid, I do say she managed to capture the imagination of the common reader who loves these connections. Uh, connections of them all from their childhood into today and into their religion. She brought alive the world of make-believe where folklore and myth mingle with history and a readable pseudo-history that had enough real history in it to anchor it in times, dates and snippets of reality. It was sound inspiration and near nonsense mingled, but in that mingling she wo wove the enduring magic um, that we all have brought into today. We still don't really know the roots of Wicca and we still all practice it. But I think we owe Margaret Murray for having allowed it to grow with that supportive gardener before people like Ronald Tutton and Philip Heselton can find our true history. And I think it's right that people are beginning to look at her as a feminist and um incredible influence and also it was her that Gardner got his nine million women from which she got from Gage and Elizabeth Gage is an American who used to run the freed slave underground railway so you're looking at people that were so dedicated to others in the great work that Rita's just been talking about in service that perhaps they lost sight of what was around them but always kept sight of their goals <laughs> so that's it <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> Melissa thank you ever so much I've just reminded everybody that it has been live streamed everybody can watch this later because you, you really have packed in so much information <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people will really enjoy watching this again and I have I I tried to find the um, the article you wrote in Wicca Ray many years ago, but of course it was in the paper version. So uh, there will be a request very soon for, hey, Melissa, can we have that article again for uh, Wiccan Raid online? I, I've do. still got that old paper from 25 odd years ago, uh, so, I, so I can do it. And unfortunately, I've got some unfortunate stuff going on in my personal life, so I couldn't put this PowerPoint together as well as I wished to. First one I've done on that paper, and there's a lot more in it, so you, you can all have the paper, yeah. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And uh, we did have one question. I've, I've, uh, there was a question about Margaret Murray and theosophy. Uh, I can't remember who it was from because it's... Um, I don't know. I don't remember. Um, oh, the book, my her first 100 years, should be republished. I, I don't know, but it was all going down at the same time, wasn't it? Yes. Um, I mean, actually, there's um, uh, our friends uh, from India. Um, I know at the time, of course, the Theosophy Society was very popular, of course, in, in, um, in Calcutta and the British Asian Society. Now, I, I'm sure that, that Margaret Murray would have had at least an inkling of what was going yeah. on in British India. So it's yeah. very possible that she would have um, dipped into theosophy. I can't Well, well exactly. You see, these are the links that this, they're still there to be yes. researched. If you think she grew up with that around her, if you think about her ideas on... Um, on reincarnation. I mean, I'm just looking at a paper that I've taken quotes out of ages ago. She probably says more in that biography and probably Kathleen Shepherd does as well. But if you look at the timing of when she was active, she was born in 1863 and died in 1963. It's right through the magical revival. She's doing all that Egyptology when McGregor Mathers is dressing up in it and the Golden Dawn's reviving the rituals and it's a small world. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's anyway, like Philip I, I, finding all these people that were knocking around together in nudist camps and things. Um, <laughs> obviously, she did know these people, and they would have been at her Egyptology talks and things. 
Yeah, I, I was just suggesting that she probably met uh, Gerald Gardner at the Atlantis bookshop. <laughs> well, she Crowley, might. We knew Alistair Crowley did. I mean, the dog off to the plough uh, on the opposite side of the road. I can't see Margaret Murray in the plough with um, with Gerald Gardner, but I can see them in drinking tea. Absolutely. Well, the thing is, in that in that early bit about once she became a suffragette, well, uh, supported suffrage in 1903, she decided to march into a room where only men were, sit down with them alone and smoke a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> this tiny little posh lady that had been out in, 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 in the slums of Calcutta nursing cholera. She was taking no shit whatsoever, you know. Yes, absolutely amazing. And certainly a bit of an icon for, for, for many of us as well. Anyway, thanks ever so much, Melissa. And we will definitely try and, and uh, publish that material in Rick and Raid on another occasion. Uh, again, looking at the time, um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. I don't know, is uh, Matt all ready to go? Yep, I'm ready when you are, Morgana. Okay, I'm going to just give a little bit of background as to who Matt is. Matt and I have known each other for quite a number of years now. Um, but just to, uh, he's um, a member of the Wolfer Coven in the northeast of the United States and located in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The Coven is part of practices in the North American branch of Horsa, established in Pennsylvania in the 1960s under the direct guidance of Sybil Leake. He is also a member of and has a lot of drive and passion for the sacred, sacred pentagraph tradition, which was first formed in Las Vegas under the guidance of Tarot Star and Shemaine Day, a real name with June Day, with guidance and input from Liberal, Civil League after Shemaine and Civil decided on a move from Houston to Las Vegas. Now today there are many covens who uh, practice that tradition or derivations from the teachings. Civil's last student from Florida, Christine, also played a role and influence in recent years on the Wolf of Coven as well since the folks she taught joined in with the cult Wolfer Coven. Thorne has also collaborated with Llewellyn author Casey Giovincio on the formation of Gala Witchcraft. He is a seated elder in the New Wiccan Church in International located in San Jose, California. His interests are varied but certainly enjoys collaborating when possible with others of various traditional paths for the furtherance and continuation of initiatory craft. He believes when we lift each other up the whole of witchcraft benefits. And I'm sure this talk, which is more anecdotal, um, Matt and I have talked a lot about Civil League because, of course, um, I'm in the Netherlands, but much of the information about Civil League is also at the uh, Witchcraft Museum in Boscastle. So I'd uh, uh, encourage all of you in the UK to go and look at some of the material there. But today, today, Matt is going to tell us a little bit more about Civil in the New forest <laughs> so please go ahead Matt thank you sure can you hear me okay yeah okay uh boy Melissa and Reese is a very tough act to follow so I will do my best so if you have any questions please feel free to put them in the chat I have a timer going so I don't go over time so uh, here I just wanted to show you a picture If anybody who's not familiar with the New Forest. There are wild ponies all over the New Forest and Sybil had often talked about that in some of her earliest books, how she'd be in the antique shop and the wild ponies would like poke your head like into the antique shop um, while you're in there working. So it was pretty, uh, pretty fascinating. Uh, let's see, how do I go forward? Oh, there we go. So I'm not gonna go over too many um, uh, bio details here because you can find a lot of those bio details like online. But she was born February uh, 22nd, 1917. Anytime you see like a public date of like how old she was, you gotta add five years to that because like she often made herself five years younger in, in bio stuff, which was kind of smart actually because she had an infinite love of astrology her entire life. And, you know, if you didn't give the exact year, you wouldn't be able to give like a uh, most accurate astrology chart. So uh, she was interred after her death in 1982 before Halloween back in Dorset, England. And uh, Ann Kirby did her funeral there in Florida before her remains were sent back to England for interment. 
And it said nature's harmony, love, hope, and a sense of tranquility. And I think that really kind of emphasizes like a lot of what, what she was going for. She was dubbed um, uh, Britain's most famous witch by the BBC. And over to the right, like on life in the new forest, there's this article here from the Boston Globe that gives like a little bit of a hint here. Um, she was definitely inspired by uh, Margaret Murray as well, like as Melissa was talking about. And, you know, it, even down to the words, like using the words like Dianic cult and things like that, you know, it was very much similar to that. But they worked their rituals in the Horsa Coven there in the New Forest and outside of the Burley Village. And they were always out, outside, like her rituals, for example, were never indoors uh, at that particular time. And they met four times a year out there, uh, what Sybil would call on a blasted heath there in the new forest around a central bale fire bonfire that was in the circle. We still do that today in our coven. We try to be outdoors when we can. Uh, when we're inside, of course, we use an altar, but like outdoors, we still work around uh, the bonfire, very similar to how Sybil did. Uh, we talked, uh, Morgana already talked a little bit about the influences in our coven, such as our coven here in Pennsylvania. After she had moved to the United States, uh, in 1964, uh, I think it was like April or May 1964, when she came to the U.S., she helped form uh, the coven here in Pennsylvania that I was initiated into that was centered around a medical office with the lead physician was the high priest and the head nurse of the medical office and office manager was the high priestess. She had also established another second coven in Pennsylvania at the estate of Mary Manners Hammerstein, who was married to Reginald Hammerstein of the Rogers and Hammerstein dynasty. So if you're ever familiar with like South Pacific or Oklahoma or the King and I, those kind of big plays, that's like another one she had founded. She did some work with Marsha Moore as well up in Connecticut. Um, Marsha Moore was a hotel heiress uh, to, was she, oh, Sheraton, Sheraton Hotels. So if you ever stayed at a Sheraton Hotel, um, but yeah, Charmaine Day and, you know, had, they had met in Houston and had moved to Las Vegas together to establish Sybil's astrology school and Charmaine, her occult shop. So Sacred Pentagraph basically became uh, out of that relationship. And Christine Jones in Florida, her very last student that uh, she had trained, um, also um, became very important to our coven as her folks ended up joining with us after Christine's death. I always ask the question, you know, did Sybil Leak uh, start the Horse of Coven or join it? There's, we don't know. We don't know. Um, there's stories. And I always try to like separate what we know as craft myth versus craft fact. And so I, I kind of always ask that question. We don't know. But like we, what we do know is that in the 1950s, she was working in, in the New Forest itself outside of Burley Village. Her earliest initiates, though, were in Ringwood, where one of her earlier uh, craft um, or one of her earlier antique shops were located. And if you actually look on some of the government websites or, or the village websites, for example, on the Burley Village website, they mentioned Sibylle right on the front page of the website on Burley Village saying, which is Smuggling and dragons are also part of Burley's unique character. During the late 1950s, famous white witch Sybil Leek lived here. She was often seen wearing, um, often seen around the village in a long black coat with her pet jackdaw. Also over here on the right, you can see the official New Forest website. So you have the Burley Village website of the town. The official New Forest website also has a picture there inside Burley Village and talks about Sybil Leek here on the left-hand side of the screen. You can see what it says here um, about Sybil Burley having the, having, uh, has a unique and quirky character uh, with witchcraft playing a large role in the village history. During the late 1950s, Sybil Leek, famous white witch, lived in the village, often seen walking around in her long black coat, cloak and her jackdaw. So a lot of people like in craft history forget like how like sometimes important Sybil was like, so if you actually look at like what some of like these kind of places say, they always mention her, but like in a lot of modern books, they seem to forget her like in terms of that. Even though like during that time period, she was, you know, world famous around the world. Her books were printed by major Manhattan publishers. 
certain, translated multiple languages right off the bat, you know, had very successful businesses and LLCs under her name, including a whole staff of folks that worked for her, uh, you know, on all of these enterprises that she had in promoting the craft after she had came to America. But back in the New Forest, for example, in Burley Village, you'll even see like one of the famous shops there in Burley Village. And this little image there on the right is, was, was a little replica model of a coven of witches, which is a store in um, Burley Village in the New Forest that Sybil actually named. So she did not um, run that store, Coven of Witches, but like the new owners at the time in the 1950s uh, wanted to give the store a rename, uh, a, na a new name. So Sybil recommended to call it a coven of witches. So Lily put Lane um, in the early 2000s made little replica models of it, um, which was a Brit. It's a British company that creates like these little miniatures that for people who set up like these little miniature villages. Um, so I took a photo of like my copy of the coven of witches here uh, for you to see. This was made in 2003 by Lily Put Lane. Here's the back of it as well. And then over um, to the right, you can see also the card that comes with it that talks about this. When it says Sybil Leek, who renamed this wonderful building, a coven of witches, oh, sorry, a coven of witches in 1960, when it finally became a gift shop selling all manner of witchy stuff. Um, so some people in the New Forest, if you visit Burley today, Burley kind of like reminds me when you look at like some of the photos of England's version of Salem in some ways, like there's lots of witchcraft uh, boutiques and stores there. And um, the legend there is really, sure. you can buy like postcards of Sybil. They got placards up like giving like history of Sybil in the New Forest there as well. But um, you could see a lot of that there. And if you ever wanted to see an interview while she was still in the New Forest, because the majority of her worldwide fame didn't happen until she came to America. After she moved here, you know, that's when she kind of blew up really big. But like um, she did, she was known in um, the UK in the 1950s locally there. Um, a lot of people, I think, sometimes forget uh, the fact that that she was um, known because she was down in the New Forest itself, whereas a lot of the rest of the cult England was up towards the north near London and some of those other places. Like, you know, Alexander's Covens were up there, up that way. Uh, Gerald Gardner's Coven Five Acres at Five Acres was up that way that he started when he did his first coven. But Sybil was down in the New Forest, um, you know, so it was a little out of sight, out of mind sometimes. But if you go to YouTube, uh, three years ago, the BBC released this from their archives. Uh, in 1963 for Halloween, the BBC went to the New Forest and did this interview um, for Halloween 1963 with Sibylique, uh, just talking about um, Halloween in the New Forest. Somebody had published it on YouTube as well. It's still on the BBC's website, if you look on there as well. So it's a really fun interview of when she was still there in the New Forest. You can see Mr. Hotfoot Jackson there. A fun story about that, um, Dor uh, Sybil Leek knew Doreen Valiente pretty well, like at that particular time period. Sybil had uh, became the first president of what was the Witchcraft Research Association. But when she moved to um, America, she turned, I think, the presidency over to Doreen Valiente. Uh, in Doreen's Rebirth of Witchcraft, she talks about how she got to hold Mr. Hotfoot Jackson, and she could tell how he got his name because his feet were actually were, were really hot to the touch. And that's pretty cool, but it's actually not where he got his name from. Uh, Sybil was a really big fan of jazz, and she would play jazz music at her home there in Burley. And every time she'd play jazz, Mr. Hotfoot Jackson would get up and start dancing like in the house. So she gave him a very jazz name because of both her and Mr. Hotfoot Jackson's love of jazz. Her and Ian Fleming at the time became very, very good friends when she was still in England. Ian Fleming um, is the creator of James Bond. So actually James Bond actually had Mr. Hotfoot Jackson do an autograph, even though him and Sybil were friends, he didn't want Sybil's autograph, he wanted Mr. Hotfoot Jackson's autograph. So Sybil gave him a little pen that he could put in his beak and just scratched a little something there for her friend Ian Fleming. 
But just a fun little cute story of that in the new forest. If you're ever visiting Burley uh, by any chance there in the new forest and you want to see where the actual site was, um, I don't have a, my own picture of the building, so I didn't want to share somebody else's picture without credit, but I'll tell you exactly where it is. Right near where a coven of witches is that you can't miss in the village, uh, you will see over there to the right an old building that has a couple businesses in it. One is called Spencer's Estate Agent, and the other is called Hermitage Beauty, which is kind of like a wellness beauty kind of shop now, it looks like, when I looked at their website. Uh, that used to be called Lawford's. I always knew it as the Lawford's building until Hermitage Beauty opened up. But where you see Hermitage Beauty there in the village is where Sybil's antique shop was located. So it's literally like very, very close to where a coven of witches is, but it's not um, the same thing. But if you look on Google Maps, you can see like, uh, you know, how close that everything is located. So Sybil in the New Forest, for example, she had a very, um, very simple philosophy. She talked heavily about a creative life force behind all things, a universal mind, a supreme being, out of which the mother goddess and the father god or horned god came from. And the tenet of reincarnation was very important to her as well, since her time in the New Forest. She believed that we all came out of this creative life force and through a process of reincarnation, that we would all be folded back within the ultimate unity of that life force itself. And then of course, the power of magic. And you could see her talk a little bit about that in her really most famous book, which was her 1968 book, Diary of a Witch, where she says, witchcraft is any religion includes the acceptance of certain tenets, which are based on faith and acceptance of a supreme being or a God without a name. From the supreme being comes life. And by the process of many incarnations, ascending a spiral of spiritual development, we are drawn back into the life force. So that was a really nice quote I thought I'd share with you. Sibyl uh, also promoted eight tenets of witchcraft, of what she saw as witchcraft. And um, I list those there for you on the screen. If you would like more information about some of those tenets, uh, you can read some of them in her book, The Complete Art of Witchcraft, she published in 1970. Uh, also, Tara Starr's book, The Sacred Pentagraph, books one through three, he lists as well um, those tenets and gives descriptions of those. And there's a photo like inside our coven temple in Tara Starr's book as well, because we're good friends. And then recently, um, Carrie Wisner, who uh, wrote a new book called The Willow Path for uh, Troy books there in England, he lists um, and gives really good descriptions as well of Sybil's tenets of witchcraft. Some other traditions like um, witchcraft traditions have adopted some of Sybil's tenets, such as a balanced life, harmony, humility, trust, love, tolerance, learning, and reincarnation have adopted them. And that's pretty cool too. It's really awesome to see those be able to spread, you know, to other places and people that find use for them. And it's not something like we ever like look at to memorize, but like we think about those internally about how those work themselves out into our life. Uh, one difference between Sybil uh, compared to some other witches of her time and her contemporaries is um, in the Horse of Coven, for example, and even today, we wear robes rather than being naked in our rights. So I put naked in thy rights um, as question mark. Sybil was not against the idea of nudity. And if you were if you were working rituals indoors, obviously it was totally okay with her. And she does put that like in her material that it's totally okay for that. But the big reason why she didn't is because they didn't have the luxury of um, being able to work rituals within a coven temple, they work them out in the middle of the forest itself. So traveling and walking like a mile into the forest, you know, with carrying a cauldron, carrying, uh, you know, your wine for the ritual and the magic sword, obviously, like when you're in the woods working like that at nighttime, beginning the rituals four times a year at midnight, yeah. wearing, um, you, or being naked out in the forest at that time was, was not easy. Yeah. And she even says that here in her complete art. Let me move it. Yeah, I'll just I'll talk. I think somebody's unmuted. If somebody wants to unmute themselves. 
Uh, she even says here, be naked if you wish, but be sure of why you wish to be naked. Certainly, if you feel that meditation is thereby easier, it's the thing to do. And also, we don't feel that clothes, when sensibly chosen, will impede the psychic juices from flowing, for it is within the mind and motions that freedom from sexual restriction must come. Meditation as well was a huge part of what Sybil um, really prized, and she was very much into that even in the New Forest, saying there's periods of time of meditation every day. I learned there's a difference between prayer and meditation. In prayer, one asks the deity to listen while she talks. In meditation, one listens while the deity speaks. I have found many people use prayer almost as a demand to achieve something when meditation might lead them to understand what might be best for them. In my own experiences, we still continued that, like when I was uh, being initiated and trained as well, like in the craft, uh, working outside, um, you know, our rituals as well. There's a picture with me and my high priestess there, like um, that was maybe five or six years before she passed away. Um, and we worked out on the hilltop outside all our rituals. I think we did every single ritual outdoors very similar in that manner, except uh, for my initiations. We were all, I was always initiated indoors, but every other ritual was outside, um, you know, and we'd enjoy a meal, have ritual, have a nice little fire outdoors. And then over to the right, you can see we still do this today. Uh, when we're indoors, obviously we have a uh, nice altar set up as well, just like everybody else does, since that is, you know, replacing the bonfire when we are outside. But so we use very simple tools at that time. Picture, uh, artful picture of us outside. Um, this is something that was very unique to um, our practice and in the new forest itself, uh, the use of ritual basins. That was very important to Sybil. And uh, they also were very practical tools when walking through the forest itself. Uh, it could be used as a weapon if you needed to when you're walking in the middle of the forest. But also in the new forest itself, Sybil had talked about how there's lots of wild heather, like the wild purple heather, and they used to sweep the new forest floor of the ritual site with that wild heather. Here in America, we don't have wild heather growing. <laughs> so we end up like, if we're, if we're gonna sweep the forest floor like that, cutting a little bit of brush uh, from a tree, such as like some pine, a pine bow, or a little bit of birch or that she had written and a couple of different things that she was up to. Of course, the, the two at the top there are some of her earliest, a shop in the high street in 1962 and have mania will collect. Those are about her antique businesses as well. A fool in a tree is a good one in terms of if you want like some fun stories about the new forest, because that book, A Fool in a Tree, that she did in 64, I think it was, 64 or 65, was about various stories that, uh, and colorful characters that she met in the New Forest. Uh, she does have a small chapter there on witchcraft as well. Um, and, you know, and then other folks as well that she had met in the New Forest. Just, it's a funny book in some instances. Um, Obviously to the right, you can also see she had a monthly astrology journal as well that you could buy at the grocery store when you're out there shopping. So every month there was a new Civil Leaks astrology journal magazine that her and some of her staff had worked on. Uh, over to the left, you could see her um, astrology was always a love, even back in England and even here in America. She established an astrology school, three brick and mortar buildings, astrology school buildings originally, that you could learn and take courses in astrology. She even had records as well. This is Sibylik's astrological de delineations to the right, where it has ja appropriate jazz music paired with your astrology sign. And this is a funny uh, photo as well. In 1970, this book you can see the difference between the American publishing houses and the UK publishing houses. In America, you can see the name is obviously emphasized, photos and things are a lot more selly in terms of getting that out there. But in the UK, uh, the title is a lot more emphasized to the book rather than the person's name. But that's, that's always sometimes like a bit of criticism that like we have like here in America about how sometimes things get very heavily marketed, but you could see like that's how that's how publishers kind of did things and marketed things. Just by looking at that, you can see how that was. And then there's a few more selections of her books. She wrote a lot of books. 
Um, you can see a bunch of them here on the screen. Here's some more books, including Sybil Lake's Astrological, Astrological Guide to the Presidential Candidates that you could, you could buy. And actually, she did predict the winner every time. So she was very good at that. Tomorrow's headlines today and some of her other ones has very accurate predictions that have come true. So she actually would predict the presidential candidates and th she was right. <laughs> Here's some more of her books that you can see, including like, you know, some of her most famous books, like Complete Art of Witchcraft, Diary of a Witch, Sibylique's Book of Fortune Telling, Astrological Cookbooks. There's merchandise you could buy at the toy store. Over here on the left, you can, but you can see a round astrology puzzle that was official Sibylique merch back in the day, uh, including she had posters, there was wheels that you could hang from your ceiling. Like, I mean, there was all sorts of really cool merch as well that you could find. Over to the right is a picture of initiation. It still carries on. We still carry on initiation um, that Sybil Lee could taught and passed down. I know I condensed a lot of things, so I'm stopping here to see if there's any quick questions. Hi. Let's see. <laughs> oh, hang on. Hi Matt, so uh, that's absolutely amazing. I've been uh, posting a few things like where the, where Burley can be found on Google Maps. It's uh, we had a lovely time tracking down her little cottage, uh, yeah. which is now called Little Bonte, and it's a little um, uh, uh, little pension, uh, sort of almost like bed and breakfast. So it's wonderful. But there is a question. There is a question from Susan. Um, she says, can you please review the name of Sybil's astrology album's name? I'm a vinyl buff and love jazz. Oh, sure. Yes, it was Sybil Leak's Astrological Delineations. Uh, there it is. Um, your, astro your delineations and your music. So Sybil Leak's Astrological Delineations is the name of the album. And she gives a little introduction as well to each of the pieces of music. There's obviously 12 pieces of music on it. Um, one that's appropriate for each of your astrology sign. Yeah, Lydia was asking uh, what astrological sign was was Sybil. She was uh, Pisces. Sybil was Pisces. Um, she was born February 17th. So she was a Pisces uh, close to the beginning. She had a Scorpio rising sign, so that's why she could, you know, she was very quick-witted, but also had a tendency that she could bite if she needed to, um, and you could see that very much because of her rising sign of Scorpio, but her uh, sun sign being in Pisces. Amazing. I know I went through a lot of that really, really quick, but that's okay. Um, I, you know, I'm obviously like available, you know, feel free to anybody can reach out with any type of questions because I just kind of skim through like a lot, but. Yeah. I, well, I've been reminding people, uh, Matt, the, the live stream of course will be uh, saved. And uh, what I'll do next week is I'll um, edit it with all, all this information, also the links with uh, all of you and books, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why I wanted to actually record it. So I've been very busy writing questions and what have you, but everything is under control, under control. <laughs> and uh, of course, what we can do is uh, this, again, like Melissa's uh, talk, or like Reese's talk as well, that can be converted into um, articles also for Wick and Write. So uh, this is why it's been so wonderful hearing all of you, uh, because of course, many, many questions are being uh, raised but it's really nice to hear you in person. So any more questions? Because as we're coming to a close now, we will be um, stopping the recording and live streaming before we go on to the next session. So any more questions before we round off this first part of our wonderful gathering? Anybody had any questions for Melissa? for Reese, I think everybody's stunned Matt <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe I don't know like I I I, I think I covered a, a good bit of ground just with the short period of time but I love this format actually it's actually pretty cool yes it is because uh, again 
because we, we are live stream, of course, we have a record, I literally have a record, so we can always go back to uh, various questions. But I, I one, the one thing, as I say, what I really wanted to uh, hear from Matt were these kind of anecdotes, because many people in the UK, I, I don't really think they know much about Civil League, and especially when we're talking about Gerald Gardner and um, the claims for the, the coven in the New Forest, when... Um, when we hear your talk, of course, we realise it was actually Sybil who had uh, connections with the New Forest. So I hope when people uh, visit to the United Kingdom to go to the New Forest and go and visit this wonderful little village of, well, it's not so little anymore. And there is a, there is a blue plaque, a very well known uh, in England, a blue plaques commemorating. And there is one also commemorating our traditional witch, Sybil Leake. So with that, I'd like to thank you again, Matt, for this very interesting anecdotal talk. And um, we will look forward to seeing you again, obviously, in Wiccan Raid. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, so here we come to the end of, and we're actually absolutely on time. It's wonderful. We always talk about pagan time. I'm just wondering if anybody's got any general questions before we leave, because a lot's been said. But again, it's wonderful to see you all online. And maybe there are some pertinent questions before we do actually leave. Would Catherine like to say anything? Our hosts, Reese, would you like to say anything before we close? Melissa? I hope everybody stays or can stay for the, for the tarot reading. Oh, absolutely. We're going, to, we're going to have a break, Catherine. I'm going to stop the yes. live streaming. So I'm going to stop the live streaming now by thanking everybody, all the people who've attended, of course, but to our wonderful speakers. You've been absolutely brilliant. Uh, yes. Thank you ever so much. And so without further ado, I'd like to thank everybody and also the live streaming. Uh, we will be able to uh, post the link to that later next week probably so thanks every, everybody for your wonderful um attention of course and we will now be stopping the live streaming there's one more question in the chat can oh hang on somebody just said told me uh there is a question is that how do i listen to one of these types of talks in general oh we'll answer that we'll answer that in the chat okay thank you so anyway without further ado thank you Ever so much, all of you, and have a nice day.